Let's open up our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. If you're visiting, we always like to let people know that we go verse by verse on Sunday morning. And Wednesday nights we go chapter by chapter. Romans chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses uh, 27 through 31 this morning. Romans 3, verses 27 through 31. Let's read those, then we'll pray. Where is boasting, then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Let's pray. Lord, as we come once again to open your word on this beautiful day, Lord, May you show us more your beauty, Lord. May you show us more your glory, Father. May our hearts be softened and readied by your Holy Spirit now to preach your word, Lord, to hear your word, Father, and to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we come to the end of Romans chapter 3. And uh, uh, just what a wonderful journey it has been so far as the Apostle Paul, as the Holy Spirit of God, is breathing through him, has set forth the case uh, in the first three chapters, basically summed up as saying this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And now Paul is expounding upon those thoughts. He's he's bringing them out. The hard part can be with with verses and chapters like this, especially chapters 2 through through 6 and 7 is there's not really a lot of quote-unquote application. This is a lot of knowledge. These are a lot of things that as Christians we need to have as as the base of our faith. Because a lot of times we just like to say, all right, dude, just tell me what to do. Tell me not what to do, and and I'm I'm good. That's all I need. No, sometimes we need the backstory. Sometimes we need, and the Lord knows that, and that's what he's doing here. He's teaching us, he's giving us the foundation as to what our salvation is based upon. Hey, he's giving us the knowledge to know, hey, where am I at in my salvation? Have I been basing it on a false law of works and of, uh, you know, of trying to keep the law, or am I basing it on faith? Now look as he continues here in verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No but by the law of faith. You know, here we have a couple of questions. Where, where is the boasting? You know, and, and by what law? And, and, and so Paul starts here by asking questions. Where is the boasting? It is excluded, he says. You know, when someone else does the work for us, when you have work done on your house and somebody comes in, boy, th- this is a nice kitchen. And we, we don't say, oh, thank you, yeah, it was, it was really hard work, uh, you know, for me to do. And when we actually hired someone to do it for us, and they did everything for us, they even designed it, we don't take credit for that. Boasting is really excluded from that, especially if we had nothing to do with it. And since Christ alone, Jesus Christ, has done all the work for our salvation, there is no room for us to boast, and that's on purpose. There, there's, there's no room for us to boast except in the shed blood at the cross of Jesus Christ. There's no boasting for you and I. And Paul says it's actually, notice he says, it's excluded. 
boasting or pride in the life of the Christian is to be excluded. It's to be put off. It's to be set aside. We read a similar verse uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. It says this, And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? And again, since we've been receiving everything, there is no room for us to boast in our relationship with Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.30 says this, If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. Now, how many of us have boasted about that lately? Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm working out, feeling better. Just woo. How's your time with the Lord? Oh, dude, I'm in every, every day in the Word, just feeling stronger as a Christian. How about, oh, you know, I've been reading the Word, and man, I just realized how weak I really am. What a buzzard I truly am. You see, that's the interesting thing with much of the, the false gospels that are out there today. It's all about you. It's all about how wonderful you are, how, all about how good you are, how about how good I am, and we don't really need to change. But what's interesting is we all know that's not true. We all do. That's why so many people, they, they, they hate themselves even. They'll say, oh, I hate myself. You know, why do you hate yourself? Well, I just hate the way I look. Well, if you hate yourself, you'd be happy at the way you look if you don't like the way you look. Seriously, I mean, hey. No, we, we love ourselves. So we don't like certain things about us because we want them to look different, perhaps. You see, we, we're not to boast in these things. We're not to boast. There's nothing for us to boast except, as Paul said, in how weak we are. Please turn with me uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're gonna, Paul goes a little further in depth with this thought. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, a lot of us know the end part of this, the end, last part of around verses 8, 9, and 10, but a lot of times we miss the first part of this. So we're going to start in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Paul the Apostle is writing, he says, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, now most scholars believe that he is talking about himself, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I, I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can I have an amen? Hey, I don't know about you, but this goes so against even much of the belief within the Christian church today. Look at this last verse again here in verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Anybody here take pleasure when you're ailing and you're hurting, you're sick or something physically going on? How about reproaches when people reproach you? How about in needs? Oh, I'm in financial needs. I'm taking pleasure in that. How about in persecutions? Or look at, he says, hey, I take pleasures in distress. 
All for Christ's sake. Hey, I don't know about you, but I'm usually crying before the Lord like a little baby girl sometimes. Oh, Lord, don't you love me? What's going on, Lord? Oh, oh, oh. Pisces, and Paul's like, dude, I'm stoked about this. This is awesome. See, it's all about our reactions in Christ. But notice what he says. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Verse 9 says, dude, I, I boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We don't boast in uh, how long we've been a Christian or how well you're doing as a Christian. We boast in Jesus Christ. We boast in our infirmities. You know, as Christians, again, there is never a place for pride. Never a place to become prideful. And, and, and to be honest, there's a great temptation. Because especially when we know what buzzers we once were. And we see the grace of God working in and through our lives. There can almost become this pride. Oh, oh, look at those buzzards out there. They need Jesus. I'm so much better. Instead of just, Lord, man, you are so gracious to me, a sinner. Lord, be gracious unto me, a sinner. You see, as we boast in our weakness, then Christ is made strong in us. Then his Holy Spirit can work in and through us for his good pleasure. You see, specifically, Paul, back in our text, is, is talking about our boasting and keeping the law to be saved. He says, hey, where is your boasting then? It's excluded, it, because it's not of law, it's not of works, it is by the law of faith. It's not a, of the work, you know, the law of works, that if you keep all these good things, you'll be saved. No, it's the law of faith, that if you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross, then we're saved. And then that will lead us unto those good works that God calls us to do out of a heart of love. Now, verse 24, remember Paul told us that justification is by grace through faith. And that then the boasting, that any boasting that we might have in being a Christian is gone. The boasting of how perhaps, you know, we never sinned like some people sinned. Perhaps we take pride in, you know, that we never, you know, fell quite as far as others into terrible sins. Oh, well, I never did that sin. I would never. And you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we can be like that. Oh, that sin's just exceptionally disgusting. Oh, boy, I, I just can't handle that. And, and you know what I'm saying. A lot of us here, we look at certain things within the church. Oh, that's really terrible. Oh, that's really bad. You know, it's sad. I don't know about you, but... I've heard many people over the years give their testimonies. And it's always disturbing to me, or kind of sad, if you will. The, you know, I've read them, I've watched them, I've listened to them, but, you know, when somebody, you know, tries, you know, to give their testimony, usually it's almost one of two ways. First, that they really never sinned that much, and they're very thankful for that, and they didn't take drugs, they didn't, you know, kill somebody, they didn't rob a bank, they didn't even fornicate, and, and so they feel pretty good about themselves, and yet they're still thankful that they got saved. And there's almost a pride at how far they had not fallen into sin. And then there's the other side. There's the one that comes up and is like, dude, I used to be in the mafia, you know, and I killed 50 people, I did this or that, or I was hooked on drugs and, and, and I was really, really bad and I be, used to beat people up. And there almost becomes this like kind of, uh, I don't know, a pride even in that. How, how bad they used to be. Oh, they're really a Christian now because they were really bad now. And, and, and it's interesting because, again, in the first uh, testimony, it can be a pride of how much they didn't go into sin. The second one can be a pride that they did go so far into sin. You see, guys and gals, what we need to remember is every sin separates us from God. Every sin, well, great or small. And there is no place for boasting. Well, I just gossiped my whole life until I got saved, and that's, I don't gossip anymore, but that's, that was my most terrible sin. Well, guess what? That sin of gossip put Jesus Christ on the cross. Just as the sin of murder or fornication or homosexuality or drugs or whatever else. There's no place for boasting. There is no place for boasting. Look at verse 28 in our text. He says, Therefore, we conclude 
that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. I love this. So Paul's been making his case, and now he's making his conclusion. He's like, therefore, I, you know, we conclude that, I'm, and again, you should, for you note takers, underline this in your Bible, highlight this. This is kind of the central part here. We conclude that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Now, even though Paul is concluding this here in verse 28, he's going to go on for a couple chapters and still talk about this. And then he's also going to go on in verses six and se- or chapter 6 and 7 and kind of defend, hey, I'm not talking because we are now justified by faith through grace so we can go out and sin like crazy. Because that's how a lot of people would have been hearing this. But Paul is just, look, he's teaching us. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Hey, may I include as well, apart from the deeds of a church? Apart from the deeds of a denomination? You see, again, there's a lot of people, you know, I talked to a fellow not too long ago that said basically that you could not be saved unless you were baptized in water. I've read about other, you know, or met other people. Hey, you're not saved unless you come to this specific church, this this specific denomination. You're not saved unless you do this, 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 and that. Uh, It goes right against the scripture that we're reading. Paul concludes that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. You know, one of the things I love about the Holy Spirit as he breathed out the scriptures through Paul and some 39 other authors is that he always continues to say much of the same things over and over and over again. Do you ever notice that? It's like, wait, didn't we just read this? Yes, we did, but notice how he said it a little different? Because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I, I need it said in different ways so it actually gets through to me. I need the Lord to kind of twist. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, hey, I get it now. That, this time I get it. Even though I just read it 15 times, I get it. I now understand it with how you're saying it. You see, what Jesus Christ has done upon, for us upon the cross, he died for us that we might be justified, as, made as if we've never sinned, justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And again, since it's of grace and is a free gift, our justification then does not come from the working of the law. Let's bottom line it again. It doesn't matter how many good things you do, it will not save you. It will not save me. Well, I'm just trying to make up for all these past sins. I'm just trying to make up for all the lost time. You know what? That's great if you're on fire for Jesus and you're just doing it because you love him, but it's not going to save you. It's not going to keep you in your salvation. Again, this isn't Bill Henry speaking. This isn't Calvary Chapel's doctrine. This is what the Bible teaches so clearly. Again, it doesn't matter how many good things we do. Again, a lot of times, even what things we think are good, those good works that the keeping of the law does not save us. We need to remember this. There are many that will come before the Lord on on a day and say, Lord, Lord, look at all the things that we did for you. Hey, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, please. See, a lot of people are all just like, hey, I can go do what I want. I can live this way as long as I continue to do good things too. No, no, that that shows a heart that's not been changed. That shows a heart that has not been regenerated by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Just as Jesus speaking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, these are those who thought by doing things, hey, I'm going to prophesy, cast out demons, do miracles. They thought by doing things that they were saved. 
Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Beloved chapter for, I'm sure, most of us here, if not all of us. 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 1. Again, it's not about our works. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith is to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. You know what, guys and gals, we can do all these things. There are many people out there doing these good things, and some of them in the name of Jesus. There's a whole social gospel movement about going out and doing good things in the name of Jesus, but they're not giving the gospel of Christ. It's all about what you do in your community. It's all about what you give to your community. Instead of the the community, their first need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about reparations, the big movement today. It's about restoration, forgiveness of our sins, the cross of Jesus Christ. But you see, there are many again that are going to come to the Lord on that day and say, look, Lord, look at all the things we did for you. They're basically, remember what we just read in the last verse in our text this morning, they're basically bragging and boasting about what they did. They obviously believe that they were justified. Even those who were doing these things in 1 Corinthians 13, they're doing these things without the love of Christ. See, the Bible makes it clear over and over and over again that we are not saved by the works that we do. If we want to be technical, God declares that our good works are filthy rags before him. And if you want a little bit of homework this afternoon, go back and look that that word filthy rags up in the Hebrew and and it'll enlighten you just how gross our, our, our good works that we think are good are to the Lord. You see, as we just read in 1 Corinthians 13, and even though if we do all these different things and we think that we're doing them for God and yet we don't have the love of Christ and we're doing them to be saved, it's, it's for nothing. You see, we should be doing the good works of Jesus Christ as his disciples as we just read in 1 Corinthians because we're driven by the love of Christ. That him who loved us even while we're yet sinners... Now we go out in love in his name. In other words, we go out and and there's no no need for a social gospel. Our heart is first for the lost. And then as we're doing that, we're going to naturally give people a cup of water in his name. We're going to naturally be helping the the lost. We're going to naturally be helping the homeless and doing things for our neighbors. That's what all Christians should be doing in the name of Christ. But it's driven by a heart of love and a heart of gratitude. Lord, uh, you're so good, Lord. You're so good. Basically reciprocating the love that God has given us through Jesus Christ as he's become, as we studied last week, the propitiation for us, for our sins. Jesus Christ died upon the cross, shed his blood. We must simply believe and have faith in the completed work of Jesus Christ that he paid the debt for our sins. This is the law of faith. We are only saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Back in our text, verse 29. Paul has has a couple more questions here. Verse 29, he goes, Hey, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised of faith and the uncircumcised through faith. You see what happens, or what happened then, and it's still true today, uh, most of the Jewish people forgot that God was not simply their God. You see, they were chosen by God. They were God's chosen people. They are still God's chosen people. He's not done with them yet. But he wasn't just their God alone. They didn't have a monopoly. He's the God of all creation. 
There's only one God. And, and, and the Jews kind of seem to forget this. Well, the Gentiles can have all their gods. No, there's only one God, and that's what he's pointing out. Look, is he the, the, not the, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there's only one God. There is only one God. Even though Satan is referred to as the God of this world, it's that mini-God, if you will. It's that false God. Hey, I can go. I know got people who worship their cars. I'm, I'm serious. I know people who wor- they wash their car. I knew this one guy my sister dated. I've sold this before. Some of you might remember, but he had this killer Toyota truck. I mean, it was, it was a four by four. It was lifted up. You can, I could almost walk under it even now. It was that high, you know, but it was pristine. I mean, it was underneath. Everything was always just clean. And he comes to me, he goes, hey, Bill, he goes, thinking about getting rid of my truck. How about you give me 3,000 bucks for it and, and it'll be good. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll give you 3,000 bucks for that. That's awesome, right? He goes, there's only one thing. I'm like, what? He goes, you have to promise me you're going to wash it every day. And I looked at him, and I'm like, what? You got to wash it every day. This guy washed his truck every day. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I wash my car maybe once a year. I, I mean, it's like, dude, we live in the Pacific Northwest, so I mean, hey, we get washed every day for the most part. But I'm serious. I, even then, I was in Southern California. When do you wash your car? It's like every day. I said, nah, no thanks. I'll pass on that one, brother. Thanks. So. But it had become his God. It had become something he worshipped. And again, we can make a God, a false God, out of anything. We can make a false God out of, I know people who worship people in certain industries, entertainment or sports or political or even education, and they worship these people as if they're gods. Some of the gods today of our culture, they're, they're sexually driven gods. They're beautiful people or they're these other people who, who say they're so intelligent or these other people who can sing. And hey, let's be honest, their voices do touch our hearts. They're beautiful or they can play or they can't. But again, they, they don't, they're not worshiping God. And yet so many people worship them and they love to receive that worship. They see, the Jews had forgotten that God was not only going to save his chosen people, the Jews, but he was also going to graft in the Gentiles. And it's all throughout the Old Testament. You can't help it but not read it all the time. You'll see it's like, and I will bring in from the outside. I will bring, you know, even with, with all the way back to Abraham. So notice what he says here. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of, of Israel? Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, he is one. So again, there's only one God. And since there's only one God... He's going to justify by faith alone the Jews and by faith alone the Gentiles. That's how, it's the same thing. He's saying there's not a different way to do it. There's one way. And we must note again that Paul is pointing back to the simple fact that the circumcised and the uncircumcised are saved only by faith, not by the works of the law. And again, he's bringing this up over and over and over again. This is because it's a simple truth of God and our salvation. Verse 31. Do we make void, or excuse me, do we make then void? I better put my glasses on here. I'm messing this up. Oh, look at that. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, I love how Paul, do you see how he's kind of almost playing the devil's advocate, going back and forth, asking these questions, and, well, then do we make void the law through faith? He could hear people asking this. Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. You see, if there was no law, there would be no need for forgiveness. Thus, there would be no need for faith. Thus, faith then establishes the law, the very need for faith, and tells us that there is a law and punishment to be saved from. Again, remember what it says back, just glance with me back in chapter 3 here, verses 19 and 20. What is the purpose of the law? Remember, obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. 
For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Galatians 3. Why don't we turn there real quick, please? Galatians chapter 3. We see Paul saying again that in a different way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Isn't it funny when you get a little Charlie in your throat or you, a quick sneeze or a cough, you look around to make sure nobody's around because you feel all, I don't have the Rona. I don't have the Rona. Galatians 3, 23 through 25. Actually, 23 and 24. Galatians 3, 23. Before the law, or excuse me, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. Bala was above, but we, are, but we were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it this way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. You see, the, 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 law, the, the job of the law wasn't to save us. It's always been to protect us, to watch over us, to be a schoolmaster, to teach us our need for salvation. Come back in our text again, verse 31, as we're getting ready to close. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So again, when we understand what the true purpose of the law is, we see that the law isn't made void through faith. On the contrary, as Paul throws in, he says, certainly not, we establish the law. Again, we can now better understand how the law is established because it was through the law showing us how sinful we are, how utterly miserable and even our best thoughts and works were before a just and holy God. It shows us our need for a Savior to be saved from our sinfulness. I like how one old saint said it. He said, the law is the light that reveals how dirty the room is, not the broom that sweeps it clean. The law is the light that reveals how dirty the room is, not the broom that sweeps it clean. You know, I was talking to someone just the other day about how they used to be a drunkard. And they said that in the middle of it, they never realized they, they brought this word up, what a slave they had been to that sin until they had been delivered from it by Jesus Christ. He said he would he had to come home every day by a certain time and make sure he had his drink and, and, and then kept drinking. And, and if he didn't get home at that time, he had to make sure that he made up for it. He was such a slave to that. He told me basically how he was a completely different person, person now and he wished he could get that time back. You see, guys and gals, what frees us from these sins not isn't the law, it's a knowledge that they are sin and that we then come to Jesus Christ to find forgiveness as we repent of our sins, believe on Jesus Christ, and are born again of the Spirit of God. You see, that's what makes the gospel so glorious. Hey, I don't care what anybody out there who's protesting in Portland, you know, the, the ones that are full of hatred, the ones that are burning and attacking and looting, they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are slaves to their sin. Before we come to Christ, we are slaves to our sin. And the law shows us that slavery. You see, when we find this, when we realize this, and we realize how sinful we are, we then can come to the cross, come to the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and find forgiveness and freedom from our sin. To find freedom from this wicked and cruel taskmaster of sin in our lives. And again, it's not that by, by any good works that we can boast, it's not by the keeping of law, but only at the cross of Jesus Christ, receiving by faith, our justification, receiving by faith our righteousness, receiving by faith his finished work and his shed blood for our sins. This then is how we are saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Father, for the law showing us our sinfulness. Lord, we thank you, Father, 
for the good news, showing us forgiveness at the cross, Lord God. I pray for those that are here, those that are watching or listening, Lord Jesus, for all of us, Lord God, that you would show us areas of our lives, maybe where we haven't been walking in this manner, Lord. Maybe we put our trust in our good works, Lord, instead of boasting in our weaknesses in you and letting you be strong in and through us, Lord. Perhaps others haven't even turned away from their sin. Maybe they've been just trusting that they're good enough persons, Lord. Lord, would you convict us, Lord, if need be? Would you draw those unto salvation? Would they feel that conviction of your spirit, repent of their sins, believe on you, Lord Jesus, this day, and be born again of your spirit, Father? Lord, we lift up our nation to you, Lord, so dark, our world, Lord God, and you told us these times would come. Lord, but you also told us that he who restrains is still restraining, Lord, and that's your Holy Spirit within each one of us, Lord. And we just pray, Spirit, that you would use us to restrain the darkness, Lord God. We pray for our president, his family, our vice president, his family, all those in authority over us, Lord God. We pray, Lord, for Judge Amy Coney Barrett, Lord Jesus, and pray that your perfect will would be done, that you would protect her, Lord, uh, from the enemy, Lord Jesus, that from the darkness that we know is coming, that you would just scatter the enemies, Lord, who take, find joy in sin, Lord God. And Lord, may you use it somehow to bring you glory, Father, and to bring many to salvation in you. And lastly, Lord, here we are. We're your children, and we lift ourselves up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.